How many times have you ran a screener and had home builder stocks pop up that look cheap, but you ignore them because you don't understand them? Well, Stock Shock has got you covered. Today, we will focus in on the home builder industry as a whole. By the end of the video, you'll understand how they operate, why they're cyclical, have more confidence and resources for gauging current cyclicality for yourself, understand what happened in the mid-2000s financial crisis from the home demand and supply side, and know what metrics can help you gauge a home builder stock's cycle risk. After that, you can decide if this is an industry you'd enjoy adding to your circle of competence and dive into further. There are six individual U.S. home builder stocks I've followed over the past few years, and while we may mention them on occasion today, I'll cover them more in detail in next month's video, as well as compare them and do some sample stock valuations. At its core, the U.S. home building business is pretty simple. You buy a plot of land, build a house, sell the house. Some home builders also get involved in the financing of these homes to the home buyer. Most of the successful home builders concentrate primarily on first time home buyers. As a demographic, they buy the most homes on average. The next most likely focus is first time move up, where price points are just above first time home buyers. When a home builder goes to acquire land for building, there are two ways to do so. The first, of course, being the simple one buy the land outright, and hold it until you have an order to build a house on it. The second is a strategy that's becoming more popular over the last few decades using something called a land option, which is actually not all that different from a stock call option in practice. Most land options are 1 to 10 years expiry. Usually the home builder pays around 10% of the value of that land down, and in return the seller agrees not to sell to anyone else until expiry, and to be forced to sell to that home builder if the home builder decides that they want it. Once the home builder confirms that the land is suitable, all permits are lined up to build, and a build order is already in, only then will they buy the other 90% of that pre-agreed price. This has recently helped home builder stocks in many ways. Only putting 10% or so down requires the home builder to take out much less debt up front. If they buy outright instead, then that land is sitting on their balance sheet until they have a contract to build. Therefore, land options are also freeing up free cash flow to be used by the home builder in other ways, like share buybacks, dividends, or reinvestments. It also locks the land down from competitors while the home builder can ensure that's correct for their purposes. If not, they can back out and just lose the 10% down. Some land options can also lock in the land at its current price. Again, much like a stock call option. Even if the option doesn't expire for many years, if the land value goes up over the next few years, the home builder is still getting to buy it for that pre-agreed lower price. On the opposite side, if the market were to crash in the meantime, and that $1 million plot is suddenly worth $750K, the home builder could just let the option expire and lose that $100,000 down. Where had they bought it outright, they'd now have a piece of land that they paid a million dollars for that's only worth seven fifty, dollars and so they'd have to write down two hundred and fifty dollars off their books. Let's explore the main factors that control cyclicality. Well, let's get the one everyone knows out of the way, which is interest rates. The current average mortgage rate controls how much money a home buyer can afford to borrow by making their monthly payment cheaper. When rates are crazy low, there are more buyers able to afford mortgages, thus there's more home demand, and buyers are able to pay higher prices to the home builders. This is great for home builders because buyers are also able and willing to buy bigger homes with more bonus features built on, both of which help raise margins. The other reason low interest rates are good for home builder stocks is the same reason low rates are good for every stock. The company can take on new debt at low interest rates, and for the time being, that will improve margins through lower interest expenses, a concept we recently discussed in a stock shock on Lumen Technologies. On the opposite side, when rates rise, then some buyers will decide to rent until times are optimal again, and the ones who do still buy are only able to pay lower prices for a home. So housing demand drops, established home builders are now more apprehensive about starting new projects, and it makes the now less profitable industry less attractive for potential new builders to enter. To me, the most interesting factor to explore in cyclicality is the shifts in a population by age. This chart from the U.S. Census Bureau is very useful to demonstrate how large generations are compared to the ones before them. On the left are decades of the past, present, and future. In colors, we have four different generations, and by looking left to right, we can see them get older in age as we go down the chart, thus forward in time. The number shown in each box is the increase in population of that specific generation relative to the one before it. In yellow are the boomers who, as we can see by their very high numbers, were a massive increase in population compared to their preceding generation. In red is the Busters, around negative 2 million less than the Boomers, hence the names Busters and Boomers. 
Echoes are in line, about 3.5 million more than the Busters, and so far the dark green newbies are looking to be projected as a 7 million increase over the Echoes. Whoop de doo! What does it all mean? So the average age of the first time US homebuyer is 34 according to Zillow. Which makes sense, you know, you're recently married, you're just having your first kid or two, and you're quickly realizing that an apartment ain't gonna cut it. You want a big house, a yard, and the white picket fence. So first and second time home buyers are the most common customers for our home builders. Therefore, I pay closest attention to this like 35 to 44 age column to gauge how many potential home buyers might be entering the market's sweet spot. Here's where we currently are. Around 3.8 million extra potential home buyers in our key demo age than we had the last decade. So this is one way you could gauge possible demand for housing in the present and in the future. If a lot of new humans will be entering the prime buying age, then that's a good sign. Immigration can potentially also boost demographics, but overall for the U.S., annual numbers of immigrants isn't too volatile. But this is something that can definitely affect demand more frequently in smaller local areas. Lastly, the strength of economy plays a major role in cyclicality. The more quality, high-paying jobs available in an area, the more salary that home buyers in that area are bringing home, allowing them to now afford a home or to afford more home than they could have otherwise. This is something that's easily and more quickly seen with regional economies. An easy example for the recent past and present would be Austin, Texas. Economic factors like low taxes have attracted more Americans and American businesses to Texas. Those new businesses, like the new Tesla Gigafactory that's being built in Austin, will provide quality jobs to the current residents and draw in more Americans. This influx of population, aka customers, brings in more businesses, therefore more jobs, and on and on the economic boom continues. So when the economy is good, people have money in their pockets to buy homes, the home builders flock in, and they ramp up production, and the home building cycle revs up. All of this is a very simplified explanation to cycles. Often the current housing market is a combination of all of these factors and is ever changing within smaller local markets as well. So with that said, how can we gauge health of the cycle right now? What are indicators of supply and demand at any given time? One useful site, which I'll link in the video description, is census.gov. Each month, new reports are given showing permits, housing starts, and housing completions for the previous month. Farther down, you can even look at the past 12 months data and trend the statistics for different unit sizes and regions of the United States. Back on the main page, you can find all this data for the past three to four years broken down by quarter for longer term trending. And you can also find more specific metrics if you wish, like average finish times, construction prices, and house characteristics. Another site I find useful, and I will also link for you in the vid description, is fred.stlouisfed.org. Here we have a chart showing the trend of housing starts, and you can adjust the time span and interval sizes. Housing starts is the number of new private homes that are coming under construction. This is measured by thousands, so when it says a thousand units, that's actually one million homes. This is the simplest gauge for how confident builders are right now. How many homes are they willing to crank out? The other thing I check here is the 10-year treasury rate, which tends to trend very closely to mortgage rates across the U.S. I'll link it for you too. So looking at this data, what do we see about the past and present of home builder cycles? There's somewhat of a sawtooth pattern that occurs over roughly five-year periods where housing starts, they'll spike over about two or three years, then come back to that start over the next two or three years. From 1990 to 2006, there was a much slower buildup of supply and then a far steeper and sharper decline than usual, resulting in 2009 being the lowest number of housing starts as far back as the data goes, even back to pre-1960. So what the heck happened there? We'll discuss that in a moment. What we see by stacking housing starts and mortgage rates on top of each other should be an inverse trend, right? The higher rates are, the less buyers will be in the market, and in turn, the less housing starts home builders will be willing to do. In general, this does appear to be true, even in smaller change instances like the one shown here. Rates raised a tiny bit at the beginning of this gray bar, and housing starts dropped. Then when rates dropped for the next two years, the starts shot back up. In 1980, rates began this colossal spike, and that effectively killed the housing demand when we look down at 1980 on the starts chart. The year after rates peaked, housing starts fell to a new all-time low for that time. While interest rates are the biggest factor to the home building cycle, they aren't always the primary driver. For example, the number of starts between 06 and 09 plummeted, while the interest rate was actually decreasing during that time, which, in theory, should have made it more likely that housing starts would increase over that period, right? 
So this decrease in housing starts must obviously have occurred for some other reason other than rates, and we'll again address it later. And as we discussed, cycles of population by age could be very valuable info for you as well. So I've linked it for you. If you also wanted to attempt to gauge economic health, which is much harder to truly do just by looking at one simple metric in my opinion, then I suppose the best way to attempt that might be finding charts of the US GDP and maybe unemployment rates and decide how you want to use that in your routine analysis. Another way to loosely gauge supply and demand as a whole could be tracking vacancy rates across the country. How many available homes are there for home shoppers? One recent resource I found and I'll link for you is a NAHB housing market index. This is a score given based on monthly surveys of those who work in the industry, asking about the strength of market conditions, new home sales present, and prospective buyers for the next six months. According to the index, demand over the past 12 to 18 months is the strongest it's ever been, and it seems there is still a very elevated number of prospective buyers in the market for the foreseeable future. And finally, some other factors that affect cycles are availability of key supplies, especially lumber, persistent poor weather, and natural or unforeseen disasters. Lumber is a complex topic deserving of its own video, honestly. If you want to know more, I suggest this podcast episode, which I'll link for you, as well as this college paper discussing the correlation between lumber and home builder stocks that I really liked. Okay, so several times we've referenced this weird period here around the 1990s to 2010. We saw that housing starts were climbing steadily up to 2006 and then bottomed out lightning fast. Well, looking at our age chart, the buildup in total homes makes sense. The boomers in 1990 were in prime first-time home buyer age and had been for a few years. There were an extra 19 million boomers in the market compared to their predecessors. So population demand was high. Looking at rates over the same period, we see that by mid-1990s, they were now lower than they had been in 20 years and were continuing to drop. And if we look at the GDP per capita to try and gauge economy strength, we see that it had really taken off during the 80s and was accelerating strongly through the 90s and 2000s. So every major factor, economy, population, and mortgage rates, were all working in favor of the home builders. Everything's coming up millhouse. So then why this? Well, the industry got a bit frothy. Because on top of all this legitimate home demand that we just established was truly present at the time, you had salesmen and lenders giving mortgages to Americans on homes that those buyers couldn't actually afford, some of which were adjustable rate mortgages or balloon mortgages, which seemed affordable in the moment, but would blow up unsuspectingly in ignorant buyers' faces in time. Unscrupulous bankers knowingly used these trash mortgages inside of financial instruments, and the greedy credit rating agencies made them look legit because they needed the business of these large banks. Eventually, the home buyers with the dangerous adjustable rate mortgages had to default, the homes got foreclosed on over the next several months as well, causing the financial instruments that held these mortgages to crash, and we had a full-scale economic crisis on our hands because the banks had intertwined those instruments so fully within our system. And then that happens. What is that? That's America's housing market. All of what I just said was an oversimplified explanation of what was a very complicated financial crisis. If you want more detail from others much more knowledgeable in this space than myself, I'm sure it's not that difficult to find. But the key thing I want to focus on is how did home builders contribute to this and fare afterwards? We established home demand was strong in years leading up to the crisis, but right around the time when the financial crisis began, you had multiple factors hurting home demand, all beginning at roughly the same time frame. Rates were largely unchanged, but after the crash, lenders were scared to give mortgages to all but the most highly qualified of home buyers, which harms demand. The crashing of those financial instruments had left many economically hindered, whether it be their employment, their retirement, or their savings were in some way damaged hurting home demand as well. Most importantly in my mind is also when we look at the population trend, it's at this exact same point in time that the key buyer demographics were quickly declining in population. As the generations for that first to second time home buyer area from the tail end of the boomers shifted to the much lower populated busters generation. So this lending and financial instrument led crisis was occurring at the exact same time that the most jarring U.S. generational population decrease in history was occurring. Homebuilders had enjoyed a 15-ish year period where their key buyer age demo had a huge surplus to now being a deficit for the next few years. On top of the poor home demand, all those homes that got foreclosed on during the crisis, they flooded the market, so there's now much more supply. 
further worsening the cycle for the home builders. People who've seen the big short know the gist of the financial instruments issue, but you can now count yourself among the very few who understand how and why our housing demand as a whole crashed so spectacularly. The timing could not have been worse. It was truly the perfect storm. Demand was bottoming and the market had two black eyes from the crisis. No one wanted to buy a home. No one wanted to lend you a mortgage if you did. Everyone was scared. If you told someone you were buying real estate as an investment, they were quick to tell you that you were insane, which as we know from Uncle Warren often means it's actually the best time to be buying. If you have a temperament that when others are fearful, you're going to get scared yourself. You know, you are not going to make a lot of money in securities over time in all probability. The key issue for home builders individually is whether they had overbuilt or not. Did they get too careless during the great times and add too many properties to its balance sheet too quickly? When this happens, they need to sell those homes quickly, thus they have to sell at lower prices. And on top of that, the debt payments are still owed in many cases. All of this is killing their margins and slowly bleeding them out. The bottom line is, if you have way more homes than you have buyers, you're gonna have a bad time. The home builder industry as a whole had overbuilt. Most of the ones who did ended up bankrupt or gobbled up by a bigger home builder at a discounted price. With fewer surviving home builders and poor cycle conditions, we set this new all-time low on home starts. The home builders who actually survived this time and held strong overall market share are home builders like the ones I follow, and they share some specific qualities. Naturally, the next question you'll likely have is, well, how can I tell if my home builder stock is more likely to survive bad cycles than others? In next month's video about these six, we will go more in depth on these metrics and why they're so important, but for today, we'll just quickly list them. Number one, size matters. The more markets you are in, the more spread out your local housing market cycles risk is. The more discounts you can get from suppliers, you gain the option to buy out struggling smaller home builders, and other more specific advantages we'll cover next month. The three biggest home builders by revenue are DHI, LEN, and PHM. During great times for the industry, small home builders flood the market and eat into market share. So all three of those lost market share between 2018 and 2020 as demand was increasing. But we need to keep in mind, most of these new guys won't be successful or even remain in business when the cycle eventually changes. In fact, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, between 07 and 12, the number of businesses in residential construction fell literally in half. Many of them were small home builders. So being big, smart, and stable can certainly be attractive to an investor. In the same vein as having a big market selection across your country, do they sell homes at multiple price points? This can help likelihood of some amount of steady sales even in poor times. Another advantage, having other means of revenues when home demand is low. This can be mortgages, insurance, uh, partially owning a land developer like DR Horton does, etc. You can check your home builder's buyer risk by searching the 10K for the average credit score of their home buyer, and you can compare it to that of the average US citizen. Is your home builder using land options in at least some of their operations? These put the home builder at less risk in a huge market downturn. NVR, for example, does 98% of their sales through land options, and they're arguably the most steady and successful home builder in the entire stock market. One specific metric, which can be found quick and free on Morningstar under key ratios, full key ratios data, if you join with a free account, is days inventory. The lower compared to their peers, the better. You don't want them caught oversupplied. Remember, any excess homes will likely have to be sold at discounted prices or written down. Days cash on hand is useful for almost any stock, but I especially like looking at it for cyclical stocks. This shows you how many days could the company pay for all their operating expenses if suddenly they had zero revenue coming in. The higher the better, and the more likely your home builder won't need to take on a bunch of new debt due to a down cycle. When a home builder has most of these things going for them, then even when the industry as a whole is selling less homes, like after the financial crisis shown in the blue bars here, the home builder is able to survive and increase its market share as DR Horton did here, shown by the blue line. As several of those little fish get gobbled up or they go bankrupt, your builder will gain market share. Now that you have the tools needed to assess market cycles and the resiliency of your home building stock, let's make bull and bear cases for the industry right now. The work from home trend that was already started and then hyper accelerated with COVID is a huge tailwind for home builders. In general, more people are moving from inner cities where there's a lot of multifamily housing and out to the suburbs to single family homes. Supply is not even close to peaking relative to demand. The monthly ratio of homes for sale versus homes sold 
has averaged 6.0 since 1963 when they first started tracking it. In Q1 of 2020, it was only 4.6. And in Q2 of 2021, it was 4.8. We're not even back to the average ratio yet. We are currently on a record shortage in housing due to a decade of underbuilding because of those fears that are left over from the 2000s crash. Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are saying they see no improvement on the shortage anytime in the near term. Fears of this being a bubble are unwarranted for those above reasons. The key reason for that housing crisis was that mortgages were given to every Tom, Dick, and Crystal that applied for one. I have five houses and a condo. Hey, there's a bubble. Looking at the population trend projections, and this is the core of my personal investment thesis on home builders right now, by the way, we see that the Echoes and Newbies look to be providing a high number of home buyers in the key age demos, specifically between now and 2024. This projects to be the biggest population demographic windfall for housing. On the bear side, in my opinion, the most likely risk to home builders today is not a huge cycle shift. It's supply chain and labor issues that are still remaining in our economy stemming from COVID. In particular, there's a lot of skilled labor shortage, and that's what we need in the home builder industry. In fact, this has already been cited as an issue by Pulte and Lennar. In their last earnings call, they said supply chain issues are significant, but yet they had still managed double-digit improvement in multiple categories and expect both the improvements and the supply chain issues to persist in 2022. I expect all home builders to be hit by this to varying degrees. However, this should be an overall short-lived issue in the grand scheme of the industry. Inflated commodity prices, of course, hinder home builders to some degree, but not as much as it does a lot of other cyclical industries. This is because home builders have price escalation clauses in their contracts that allow them to pass on a lot of these increased prices of materials to the home buyer instead, keeping gross margins for the home builder from getting too deflated in the current high commodity environment we find ourselves in in 2021. With that said, even though they're keeping margins in check, there still will be less people able to afford housing if everything is overinflated. Some feel like home builder stocks will continue to trade at lower multiples than they probably deserve for many years due to many analysts remaining gun shy after the disaster of the Great Recession. The 15% increase in home prices over the last trailing 12 months will certainly send some buyers to the side, waiting for prices to stabilize. And lastly, the national foreclosure moratorium could cause some Americans to default eventually, raising home supply. I hope you now feel prepared to assess a home builder for yourself. Check the video description for all the links to resources shown in today's video. If you want to see quantitative and qualitative analysis between those of six aforementioned home builders, subscribe to the channel for the next video. And as always, good luck in building wealth for yourself and for your family.